Hello dear viewers, this video will be all about a series where life truly found a way. Movies with some of the best visual effects ever, and a comic book with some seriously beautiful art. All of which, honestly, still haunt my dreams to this day. So let's talk about The Fly, Monster Outbreak. What happened after the movie explored? I'm Andrew Lapamardo, your narrator, and this is Marvelous Videos. When David Cronenberg came up with The Fly in 1986, he did not shy away from the fact that his body horror film took inspiration from both the French-British writer George Langland's science fiction horror short story, also called The Fly, as well as Kurt Newman's 1958 sci-fi horror flick, also titled The Fly. The end result, as everyone knows, was the movie becoming a huge box office hit, and, may we add, the biggest commercial success of the Canadian director's career. Starring Jeff Goldblum in the lead, The Fly has him as an eccentric scientist who is gradually to transform into a grotesque-looking fly hybrid creature post one of his experiments goes terribly wrong. The Fly 2 followed in the year 1989, which had Chris Wallace, the makeup effects artist of the first movie, directing the sequel. While it is true that the second movie became a major recipient of way too many unfavorable reviews, there's a comic book series that followed, one that picked up right after the events of the sequel. We are talking about The Fly Outbreak, which is fair to say a continuation of The Fly franchise. This brings us to today's video, where we will be exploring not just the movies, but also delve deeper into the five issues of the comic book series. Are you ready? Let's get this thrill ride started right away. Before we go into our explanation, Nation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. The Amazing Story of the Fly Movies Explored The Fly 1986 Scientist Seth Brundle believes that he is working on something that is not only about to change the world, but also human life. He meets journalist Veronica Quaife at a science conference party hosted by Bartok Science Industries, and tells her that he is about to make a scientific breakthrough of the century, further inviting her to his apartment. There he shows her the telepods that he is working on which the reporter initially makes fun of by calling them designer phone booths. But after Seth gives Veronica a live demo, teleporting her stocking from one telepod to the other, she gets intrigued and decides to fill in her editor and former lover, Stathis Borens, about the telepod despite Seth's objections. Of course, Stathis does not believe her and calls Seth a con man. Later, with Seth meeting Veronica, he tells her that as much as he'd like to let everybody know about his invention, his creation is not yet ready, and that his telepods are only capable of teleporting inanimate objects. Seth offers Veronica a proposal, telling her to document the whole process of him bringing to perfection the teleportation of living things, to which Veronica happily agrees. She starts recording his work, and the duo begins to spend a lot of time together. During one of his experiments, Seth attempts to teleport a baboon, but the process is unsuccessful, leading to the eventual death of the animal and turning it inside out. The eccentric nature of Seth starts attracting Veronica towards him, and they end up sleeping together. After their first intimate encounter, a sudden realization dawns upon Seth, and he ends up experimenting with a stake this time. Post the stake gets teleported, it becomes clear that his telepods are reinterpreting things instead of reproducing. This prompts Seth to make a few changes to the system, thereby making the teleportation of a second baboon successful. Their moment of celebration is short-lived. A certain parcel from Stathis catches the attention of Veronica, and she opens it to find a cover story design on Seth's telepod story. She leaves immediately to prevent Stathis from publishing the story, and while she is successful in doing that, Seth is left to celebrate his success, drinking all by himself. The drunken Seth deduces that Veronica left abruptly because she still had feelings for her former lover. On the spur of the moment, he places himself inside the telepod, oblivious that a housefly had managed to get inside his very pod. Nonetheless, Seth successfully teleports himself to the other pod, 
and emerges outside looking absolutely normal. Veronica comes back later that night and both are seen to reconcile. The next morning, Seth displays an amplified strength and flexibility level, flaunting a rather athletic physical build. From consuming abnormal levels of sugar to having an everlasting sexual stamina, Seth gives full credit to his teleportation device for apparently cleansing his body. He also has patches of unusually coarse hair growing from a wound on his back. There comes a point where he forcibly tries to make Veronica go through the teleportation process, and upon the latter refusing, he becomes aggressive towards her. Veronica is pretty sure that something went wrong when Seth went through the process earlier, and with her stating that to him, he leaves her alone in the apartment calling her a coward, and goes to find somebody who can keep up with him. Seth visits a bar and engages himself in an arm wrestling fight with another man. He tells him if he wins, he gets to take the latter's girlfriend home. Thanks to Seth's newfound superhuman strength, that he not only wins, but he also breaks the man's arm in the process. There's also this weird white secretion that oozes from his hands. Anyway, he brings the woman named Tawny back to his apartment, and not only does he indulge in all sorts of carnal activities with her, he tries to make her go through the teleportation process. Of course, Tawny does not want to, and they both get interrupted by Veronica. With Seth mockingly addressing Veronica as his mother, Tawny leaves. Veronica informs him that she tested some of his coarse hair growing on his back, and found out that they were, in all probability, insect hair. Seth dismisses her assumptions, calling her ridiculous, and kicks her out of his apartment, telling her never to come back. Eventually, he realizes that his body is going through visible changes. There are blemishes on his face, his fingernails are coming off, and there's more of this white fluid that is oozing from his fingers. Convinced that something is certainly wrong with him, he starts going through the past record of his teleportation and discovers the presence of a secondary teleportation element which is eventually disclosed to be a housefly. To his horror, he finds out that there has been a fusion of him and the fly at a molecular genetic level. Four weeks pass by, and Seth finally contacts Veronica, telling her that his condition has deteriorated, and asks her to see him. Veronica arrives at his apartment and is shocked to see him, he is hideously disfigured and is even resorting to a walking stick to move. Seth tells her about the fly and calls himself the offspring of Brundle and Housefly. Veronica is even more horrified to see one of his ears fall off, and with Seth begging her to help him out, she pays a visit to Stathis and tells him everything. While Stathis initially warns her not to go back to Seth for obvious reasons of infection, he eventually tells her to go to the apartment tape Seth's activities and then bring the footage to him, so as to figure out what can be done. While Veronica returns back to Seth, she finds him crawling on the ceiling. Seth tells her that the disease wants to turn him into a fly, and he even addresses himself as Brundlefly. Furthermore, he wants her to chronicle his metamorphosis. He begins by showing her his new way of eating which is breaking down solid food with a corrosive enzyme that he vomits and then sucking up whatever remains of the food. Stathis is sickened by the footage, and with Veronica further telling him that she is pregnant with Seth's baby, he is even more appalled. The next when we get to see Seth, he is no longer seen to wear any clothes. He looks more like a lump and doesn't even look like a human anymore. He is seen treating the fallen body parts as a relic and storing them inside the bathroom cabinet. With Veronica paying him a visit, he tells her to leave and never come back. It is pretty clear that his insect instincts are taking over him, and he doesn't want to hurt her. Veronica leaves tearfully and tells Stathis, who has been waiting for her outside the apartment, that she wants to get the child aborted right away. Unbeknownst to the duo, Seth overhears this conversation and follows them all the way to the doctor's office. Right before the procedure is about to begin, Seth breaks into the chamber and kidnaps Veronica. He tells her to have his baby as it is the last thing that's left of his humanity. Meanwhile, Stathis makes it to Seth's apartment carrying a shotgun with him. Seth catches him by surprise and looking at Stathis defending himself with the gun, he vomits his corrosive digestive enzymes on the latter's hand and leg, thereby melting them and sending him to a state of shock. 
He is about to vomit on Stathis' face when Veronica interrupts and begs him not to do so. Seth leaves him and crawls back to Veronica, asking her to help him be human. He tells her his ultimate plan, how he wants to use the telepods to fuse them both along with the baby and become the ultimate family. A family of three, but joined together in one body. He activates the fusion sequence and attempts to get Veronica inside one of the telepods. A struggle between them has Veronica inadvertently ripping off Seth's jaw, one that brings about his final transformation as the Brundle Fly. The fully transformed Seth throws her inside one of the pods and steps inside the other telepod. With just 30 seconds left for the fusion sequence to begin, Stathis comes back to his senses and uses his shotgun, firing at the cables tethered to the computer, which results in Veronica's telepod going offline. While Seth is able to break his telepod glass, he is not able to escape from his pod, thereby resulting in the fusion of Brundle Fly and the telepod. What emerges out of the receiving pod is a distorted Brundlefly telepod hybrid. As it crawls towards Veronica with its mangled remains, it signals her with its claw, asking her to put it out of its misery. The movie ends with an inconsolable Veronica unable to bear that sight and blowing its head apart using the shotgun. The Fly 2, 1989. Seven months after the events of the first movie, Veronica Quaife is seen to undergo an exceedingly painful labor at Bartok Industries the very company which had funded Seth Brundle's earlier experiments. Witnessing a larvae sac come out of her proved fatal to Veronica, and she is seen passing away out of shock. The moving sac is cut open and a normal looking baby emerges out of it, one who is immediately adopted by Anton Bartok, the head of the company. The child is named Martin, and he is seen to grow up inside a highly supervised clinical environment. His life cycle is dramatically accelerated, and he is seen to possess a photographic memory, which means he doesn't just learn information, he consumes it. To top things off, he never sleeps and boasts high-level brain power. We are talking about him effortlessly gaining Zone 4 security access. His curiosity takes him to a room filled with caged animals that are being held for testing, and it is there that he befriends a golden retriever. He ends up disclosing to the dog about a rare disease that he has inherited from his father, which the doctors have named Brundle's Accelerated Growth Syndrome. Apparently, this is the disease that is causing his accelerated growth. The next day, Martin is seen taking some of his dinner to the dog only to find its cage empty and the animal having transferred to Bay 17. He goes there to find telepods, just like his father's. Next, he finds the same dog being placed inside one of the telepods for teleportation. The process is initiated, but the end result has the dog severely mutated. Seeing the animal attack a scientist terrifies Martin, and he is comforted by Bartok later. The following scene moves to Martin's fifth birthday celebration, one where he looks fully matured. Bartok tells Martin that he has finally earned his privacy and gives him his own private place, a wide open, beautiful living space inside the Bartok property. Next, he offers him a job at the Bartok Industries, asking him to finish his father's work. As for Martin, he is still shaken up by the incident of that dog. Bartok assures him that it was a tragic mistake and that it is all in the past now, further telling him that they did not let the dog suffer for long. Bartok tells Martin to focus on the future and that the telebods represent new age. He even hands Martin his father's record of progress and urges him to go through it before taking the final decision. The videotapes are the ones documented by Veronica that have Seth stating how invigorated he felt post the teleportation. Mind you, the video is from Seth's initial phase where he wasn't even aware of his mutation. But on the other hand, Martin gets intrigued by his father's tapes and starts working on the telepods. He gains success when he is able to teleport a phone and soon makes up his mind to teleport organic matter. Post Post encountering a Bartok employee named Beth Logan, he takes her cactus and attempts to teleport it only to have it gravely distorted. Anyway, Beth and Martin eventually become good friends and the former ends up inviting the latter to the specimens division party. Martin attends the party and learns about the hideous deformed golden retriever still being kept alive and studied. When he sees the pathetic condition of the dog, he storms out of the party and puts the dog to sleep himself later. The next day, Bartok informs Martin about someone breaking in and causing damage at the specimen's division to which the latter lies. While it is clear to Bartok that Martin is lying, he doesn't say anything to him. 
Martin reconciles with Beth and even demonstrates to her the teleportation of a kitten without causing the animal the slightest bit of harm. The duo becomes lovers after that, but the next morning, Martin wakes up with an open sore on his arm. Thinking it is because of the inherited mutant DNA, Martin asks his telepod computer if it can be replaced, and this is when he learns that it is possible, but only if there's another healthy donor. But post the gene swapping, the healthy donor will transform into a horribly disfigured mutant. While Martin does dismiss the idea, he starts showing symptoms of the early stages of genetic metamorphosis. As for Beth, she is transferred from her current work area, and even handed a videotape that has her and Martin in bed. With Martin finally able to contact Beth, she informs him about the videotape. A highly pissed Martin eventually discovers hidden cameras inside his new place, post which he breaks into the surveillance room, only to find out that every minute of his life has been taped without him having even the slightest idea. After learning the bitter truth about his father, he is able to comprehend what is about to happen to him. Bartok confronts him, stating how he is the real model and that the telepod is nothing but a tool. Of course, he wants the whole mutation to happen and tells Martin to accept his fate, but the latter flees from the facility. Bartok has his scientists activate the telepods only to find out that Martin has installed some kind of password without which the system cannot be accessed. The first wrong password will itself automatically erase all the internal programming. As for Martin, he makes it to Beth's houseboat and fills her in on everything. Beth decides to help Martin out and together they run away before Bartok's men break into Beth's place. The duo now visits the recluse Stathis Borans at his place, and they learn from him that whatever cure they are looking for has got to do something with the telepods. Stathis tells them to take his jeep and they spend the night at a motel. His aggravating transformation takes a toll on Beth, who is left with no option but to call Bartok and surrender themselves. Martin has already transformed into a cocoon and is brought back to the facility. While Beth is questioned about the password, the cocoon bursts open and a fully transformed Martin emerges out of it. Goes without saying, Martin goes on a bloody rampage, brutally killing scientists and security guards. Eventually, he breaks into Bay 17, and while he does not harm Beth, he grasps Bartok and coerces him to write the password for him, which happens to be Dad, thus activating the gene-swapping program. Next, he forces Bartok inside the telepod along with him, and signals at Beth using Bartok Bartok's hand to initiate the teleportation sequence. Beth does so and Martin emerges out of the telepod, restored to his human form. The same cannot be said for Bartok, who emerges out looking like a horribly hideous mutant. Bartok is seen suffering the identical fate to the mutated golden retriever. He is kept inside the same holding pen, and even seen to eat from the same bowl. And in a similar manner, the movie ends with a close-up shot of a housefly sitting on the side of the bowl. What happened after the movie? The film franchise was carried ahead all thanks to IDW Publishing coming up with a five-issue comic book series called The Fly, Outbreak. Written by Brandon Seyfert, this comic book miniseries is seen taking a lot of characters as well as plot elements from Chris Wallace's The Fly 2, thereby staying loyal to the sequel. But having said that, one cannot really deny that the novel does have its own adaptation as well as its own continuation. So here is us, exploring all the five issues for you in detail. Issue number one. The opening scene of the comic book is bound to give fans of the Fly franchise some major Bay 17 vibes. There are two telepods in view, and it is pretty clear that the machines are in action. We have Martin Brundle and his personal assistant, Nolani, conversing with each other. Nolani asks Martin why he does not want kids, to which the latter says that as much as he wants to have children, he is aware of his buggy genes. Their conversation comes to an abrupt halt, and we see Martin heading towards one of the telepods and calling out to Anton and asking him if he is all right. By now, we are pretty sure that Martin is trying his level Level best to treat Anton for his mutant condition. But we look at Anton and we know it for a fact that Martin has not been successful yet. Anton is still the same grotesque looking monster 
Nolani informs Martin that his presence is next required in Transgenetic Lab 12, and that she will drop a message to his wife Beth on his behalf so that she is aware of him working till late. She also asks him if he remembers what day it is, and if he is certain of not wanting a dinner reservation. Martin tells Nolani that he'd like to have a usual quiet night at home with his wife. Speaking of the night, it turns out to be a pretty kinky and one that has a fair share of BDSM activity. But when it comes down to the main part, Martin straight away refuses to make love to Beth without using a condom. It doesn't matter to Martin if it's their anniversary that night. He is not ready to infect his wife at any cost, and even goes to the extent of considering himself an asymptomatic carrier. Later that night, he holds himself accountable for Anton's current condition, but Beth has already grown tired of this conversation. It has happened in the past, so she stops him right away, telling him that Anton was already a monster from before. Beth further tells Martin that she hoped things would be different, but then given that it has been some time. While Martin promises her that things are going to change and that he needs her to be strong for a little while longer, Beth clearly doesn't seem to be convinced at all. The next morning, we are back at the Bartok Industries, when we along with the scientist Jefferson discover that Anton is no more a hideous looking mutant. He has upgraded and we are specifically talking about him getting transformed into a full-fledged four-armed fly monster. While a horrified Jefferson is fast enough to call for security, Anton vomits digestive acid on his face from above, thus melting his upper part and escapes from there, taking Jefferson's access card. With Anton running free inside the facility, it is only fair to say that he goes on a complete rampage massacring people, or let's stick to melting their faces. An announcement is made asking everyone in the facility to lock their doors and stay where they are. Martin not only realizes that it is Anton, but comes to the conclusion that while he was trying to downregulate his insect genes earlier, he must have upregulated them. His conversation with Nolani is short-lived, with Anton finding his way towards Martin. He is seen using some kind of voice device and calling Martin his son, and also asking him to admit that it was him who turned him into a monster. With Martin telling Anton that he has always been a monster, the latter charges towards the former. Martin resorts to a nearby fire extinguisher, using it on Anton, and flees from the room, only to be pursued by the flying Anton. The security shows up at the right moment and shoots Anton down. While Anton's body is taken away, Martin, along with the rest of the staff of Bartok Industries, in short, everyone exposed to Anton, is put under quarantine, till every single one of them is ruled out of being infected. Issue number two. It is the eighth day of quarantine. Martin is seen contacting Beth and cluing her in on everything that has happened so far. He tells her he isn't sure if he or anybody else for that matter is infected yet and hangs up abruptly. We are introduced to two men in hazmat suits, Major Verwin and Dr. Mayweather. Martin tells the duo that if he is to develop a cure for the transgenetic infection, he'd appreciate it if he had zero interruptions and visitors. Major Verwin seems to be a bit hostile towards Martin and even accuses him of the whole screw up. The duo leaves after Martin tells them that he wants to be left alone so as to get his work done. He calls up Beth again and tells her that the whole thing is classified and that he isn't really allowed to be in touch with anyone. He tells her about the telepods that he has been given to find a real cure. We along with Beth finally learn that Martin and the rest are being quarantined at an old Ebola quarantine hospital on the North Brother Island, somewhere in the East River. Soon, we jump into the ninth day of quarantine, and some people are already seen to be quite irked with Martin, downright accusing him of being infected. After all, when Anton was shot, Martin was pretty much bathed in his blood. Anyway, we see Martin sitting alone in the cafeteria and joined by Nolani. We learn from their conversation how the transgenetic infection works. Stage 1 has the infected developing coarse fly hair growing out of an open wound and adding to the bipolar 1 disorder. Less need for sleep, increased energy level, rapid mood swings, and hypersexuality. And it is also pretty cool to actually see some of the quarantined people concurrently going through the stages themselves while Martin explains things to Nolani. 
Then comes the part where he tells her about the infected in possession of newfound powers. Enhanced strength, balance, flexibility, and endurance. Stage 2 is where everything goes downhill as one begins to transform. The readers are next taken to the 15th day of quarantine. One that shows a highly agitated quarantined person literally picking up a cafeteria table and throwing it right towards Martin. Later, with Martin filling in Beth about the cafeteria incident and how crazy things are becoming, she dresses and shows him a vibrator that she calls a belated anniversary present. Needless to say, Beth indulges in an act of self-pleasure, but with the sudden intervention of Nolani. Martin is forced to turn off his computer screen. As if he hadn't had enough of crazy things for the day, Nolani ends up kissing Martin. While he resists her, telling her that he is married, Nolani is not in the mood for a no. It is only after she demonstrates a hedge stand with one hand that Martin's able to figure out that she is infected. Nolani, with an amplified strength level, is easily able to hurl Martin, and it is only after the latter is able to lay his hands on a ripped out telepod power cord, an electric the former with it that he is able to incapacitate her. The second issue ends with Martin on a video call with Beth, telling her that he will not be having any further distractions, and that till the time he does not find a cure, he won't be talking to her. Issue number three. This issue begins with Martin experiencing a nightmare, one where he sees everyone who had been quarantined transform into fly monsters and escape the compound. He is seen blaming himself for the outbreak, when he gets woken up by Nolani. We learn Martin has been administering all the quarantine turned crazy ones with doses of lithium. Apparently, the medication has helped them in terms of delusions, impulsiveness, as well as hypersexuality. Nolani is seen apologizing to Martin for her outrageous behavior yet again. With Martin leaving for a quick pee break, he encounters Officer Ross and sees the starting of his metamorphosis. It goes without saying that the particular encounter leaves Martin highly doubtful about ever finding a cure. He is comforted by Nolani, to whom he confides that he misses ice fishing with Beth the most. Of course, it is the little things that make life worth living, but with more and more people starting to transform and some going to the extent of becoming suicidal, Martin comes to the point where he considers taking the affected off their medication. Speaking of all the patients, they are mentally quite aware of whatever it is is happening to them. It is almost like they are breathing in hell. Martin, upon not being able to see them like that, comes up with his tried and true solution, the gene swap process. One that requires a second gene donor and a teleportation process. It is a rare case where the solution and the problem seem to be the same thing, and this ends with Martin's solution getting rejected. In due course, all of the patients are seen getting transformed into cocoons. With the infected going through their final stage, which is hatching, Martin is seen getting drunk and drowning in his sorrows. He calls himself a a failure, further stating that he was born to murder and conceived to fail. A Malathian approach is seen to be taken by the army, or in other words, the nitrogen hypoxy plan, one that is painless, colorless, as well as odorless to put the creatures down. Coming back to Martin, he is actually seen addressing one of the cocoons as Nolani and apologizing for not being able to help her get better. With the patients literally jumping to action from their cocoon selves, they are seen transforming into alien-like fly monsters and ambushing everyone in the hospital. The issue ends with Beth, unexpectedly showing up to the facility and saving Martin, who finally accepts that it is the beginning of the outbreak. Issue number four. All hell breaks loose now that the human-fly hybrids are seen escaping from the compound. Beth is left with no other choice but to shoot one of them. It is not a choice anymore. The creatures just cannot be allowed to leave the island at any cost. With Martin stopping and kissing Beth on her forehead, she accuses him of leaving her again. The high point of this particular moment is their adorable chemistry on display. Nonetheless, their cute bickering comes to a halt when Nolani shows up in front of the duo. While she appears to look like a regular soldier, we are stressing upon her walking and talking. The minute she takes off her mask, they realize she is infected. With the duo asking her how she ended up finding them in the first place, Nolani gives credit to her good eyesight. With her preparing to get up on the boat, Martin tells her that he cannot have her leave the island, not when she is infected, and that she would surrender herself to the army. While there is no denying that the infected Nolani does not behave like some kind of empty-headed killing machine, 
She looks, and at times, behaves downright creepy. We have her threatening the duo by pointing her gun at them, and at the same time telling Martin to help her out. The fact that Nolani is an advanced hybrid shows with her giving a demo of her boasted speed and reflexes when Beth attempts to attack her from behind. The following scene shows Martin and Nolani inside two different pods, and the gene swapping process is initiated. Of course, Nolani is restored back to her human self, and is safe to be cured. As for Martin, he emerges out of the pod transformed into this exceedingly frightening and hideous looking monster that we have all been waiting to catch a glimpse of. Issue number 5. Martin's new form is categorically terrifying. He is seen stating to Nolani all the possible ways to punish her. The list of options is pretty long. There's dismemberment, disembowelment, compound fracture, and digesting her one limb at a time. After all, the punishment of someone responsible for threatening Beth and then turning Martin back to his hideous fly form should be anything but treated lightly. Gripping Nolani by her hand, Martin flies away with her and it is pretty unique to see this terrifying looking creature caught up between his primal cravings and the urge to do the right thing. The following scene has the readers taken to Major Verwin and Dr. Mayweather. The duo are seen battling the fly monsters, when, to Verwin's horror, Mayweather is finally seen giving in to the virus. A terrifying looking fly burst out of his hazmat suit, and if you ask us, it is definitely one of the high points of the comic series. As the story moves ahead, Nolani is seen coming back to Beth and tells her to be armed with guns. Beth is quite taken back by her behavior and she lets Nolani know that she is here to save Martin and not kill him. Nolani tells Beth that Martin's not going to come back to his previous self given that he likes being a monster now. Also, nobody with a sane mind would want to volunteer to become a monster just so that Martin can be human again. Beth can hardly believe the words coming out of Nolani, especially after Martin literally went through the whole transformation process just to help her restore her human form. Martin is seen making a grand entry and this time along with a friend. With Beth asking him the reason behind him doing all these things, he tells her that he has seen the future and that he is going to get rid of the bugs and add new features to the system. With Martin grabbing Nolani once again, he gets stabbed with a knife on his back by Beth. In order to make Martin human again, Beth makes use of the telepods to absorb the trans genes of Martin and she eventually emerges as the Bride of the Fly, may we add. As for Nolani, she is seen shooting the transformed Beth and telling her that everything has now come down to stopping the Flypocalypse. It is years later and pretty much at the end of the comic series that we learn the last name of Nolani happens to be Tanaka. Also, the series ends on an ambiguous note. We are uncertain if Martin is actually dead, as Nolani is seen opening a particular door using her card key post, which we are able to get a clear view of a humanoid fly. There's also another interpretation to this, that Nolani has been keeping Martin isolated all these years post the outbreak with the sole purpose of curing him one day. The fly outbreak defines old school horror to sheer perfection. It is the artwork that immerses you completely into its dreamy yet nightmarish atmosphere. Every character that you look at will remind you of the original actors, who aced their roles. The fact that they have been portrayed to such accuracy makes it the biggest selling point of this comic book series. It is literally like you are watching stills. Also, the storyline remaining true to the movie franchise plays a huge role. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.